So uh, why, why did you feel like you had the need to diversify geographically? So one is a need, another is a want. Um, from the want aspect, I enjoy what I'm doing. I have a level of freedom that is hard to explain. I'm free. Like I'm, I'm truly free. I, I am free as a bird. I can go anywhere, anytime I want in the world. Um, I don't have any governments harassing me with regards to anything. I'm, I'm completely free. <laughs>
so the the way I look at the world is I look at the I look in my head there's always a map of the world right with a whole bunch of macro indicators that's that's my kind of nerdy side I, I have a map of the world in my head and as the world evolves I try to see I try to find the opportunities to try to see where some markets are potentially undervalued or where some markets have potentially big catalysts coming, but where people don't quite, where it's not in the price yet, right? When I see a market like this, I go there for a few weeks or a few months. I spend time. I try to see things on the ground. Am I right? Am I wrong? Is my thesis good? Uh, what do I need to change? If my thesis is generally all right, then the question is, how do I play it, right? So for example, in 2019, all my indicators were flashing green for Uzbekistan in Central Asia. It's a little country, actually not that little, um, twice the size of Kazakhstan in terms of population. Um, they were opening up. All indicators were green, uh, red carpet for foreign investors, low debt levels, full of commodities, big industrial base. Uh, they had been under this like communist regime for for since ever, even after the Soviet Union. It was still a very communist guy that was in charge. He died. New president came over. Red carpet to foreign investors. Young population, educated population. Just everything looked great. So I took a flight there, um, stayed there for a few weeks, a bit over a month. And my plan initially was I want to buy prime, like AAA real estate in the center because it's still not that expensive. The issue was that buying real estate in the center was not impossible of the center of the capital city, Tashkent, but it was a bit of a gray zone because technically foreigners are not allowed to own real estate in Uzbekistan, at least the type of real estate I was interested in. And they're really not allowed to rent it out. But if you create a local company, it's technically kind of okay but not in the spirit of the law etc so a lot of gray zones and then i saw that there was a a stock market in uzbekistan i was like huh you know who would have thought a stock market in uzbekistan so i went to see a few brokers and then i i came across companies that were growing like 30 40 percent a year that had zero debt on their balance sheets that were paying dividends of like 20 percent so, you know, and all I needed to do was just wire the money, yeah. buy these stocks, which would take a few weeks to build a position because of the low liquidity, which is a risk, um, and then just sit back and enjoy the ride. And essentially, I just thought, cool, well, I guess stocks are the better way to play Uzbekistan. So then I played with Uzbekistan with stocks. So essentially, this is my methodology. So... That was a success story for you. What about any challenges you faced? Like, were there any countries that you went to and it just didn't work out? Yeah. So my biggest mistakes were when I was still working full-time, 60, 70 hours a week on, uh, yeah, the board of Nestle there in Ghana. And I wanted to make real investments, real estate investments. And I would have only a week two weeks to go somewhere and buy something. I'm sure a lot of your audience is familiar with this. They're American. They work a lot. Uh, they probably have only two, three weeks of vacation a year. You know, a few days for Thanksgiving, a few other days around Christmas, you know, a week at the cottage and in summer. And then that maybe leaves you with a week to do your personal affairs. Um, so, I, I, you know, I would just fly down somewhere for a week and just buy real estate. And... I made a few mistakes in terms of the, that I made back then because I just didn't have the time to do the proper due diligence and uh, market analysis. So, for example, I bought some villas in Ivory Coast in West Africa, and I didn't have enough time to choose the right property manager. And uh, the property manager essentially got divorced. He was a Frenchman. I ended up with this local Ivorian wife who ran away with my money, you know, stuff like that. So 
dealing with international real estate is not always easy. Um, you want to make sure that you do the proper due diligence on the people that you work with because you will be very dependent on local management once you're far away. So for people that work nine to five jobs, either here in the US or in Canada or even in Europe, um, do you do you think that this is something that they could do in a scaled down version? Yeah. Like, what would you what like what would you suggest would be a scaled down version of what you do? That so like someone that's making like maybe 70, 80, 100 grand a year, working nine to five in America, like what could they do? They've got like limited time off um, to to really assess the oh, look. To be fair, to to start making an interesting international real estate investments where you can get some half decent cash flow, you want to have at least 150k to play with. Because generally speaking, as soon as you leave the US or Canada, you don't have access to leverage in those markets. Right? If you go to Colombia as an American, uh, no bank is going to lend you money. Even if they do, when the paperwork would be a nightmare to you'd be paying 13% a year. Mm. So generally, as soon as you venture overseas, you either get funding from your own bank in the US and Canada, or you just venture out with cash. So that's that's one constraint that people must be aware of. Two, I would tend to think that it's a bit easier to invest overseas now internationally than like six years ago because there's so many more resources online. And there's so many people that have moved to other countries. So right now, in for example, on Ivory Coast, there's a multitude of half decent property managers, which there wasn't back then. You know, as people move away from the West, away from Europe, away from North America, uh, they move to Latin America, et cetera, for a host of reasons. Um, you're seeing it's generally one of the first things that people get into. They either make money online or they get into tourism or they open a restaurant or they get into real estate. So increasingly you can find half decent property management in, in many parts of the world. So I would tend to think that it's it's easier now. Same thing with accountants. You know, when you invest overseas, you need to have a CPA that understands the whole concept of investing overseas, double tax treaty agreements, et cetera. They're increasingly aware of, of such matters. So I would say that it is not the easiest thing to do, uh, but it's still very doable. There's increasingly a talent pool that can help you with this. Um, and you just need to, you know, be honest with yourself. Is this something that you're ready to deal with? Because you'll be dealing with ambiguity. It'll be far away. Um, and you need to be comfortable with this. Like, how bad do you want this diversification? Do you want to diversify? Maybe you're completely fine, you know, investing in Denver or whatever, wherever you're from. Um do you feel the need to have money in Colombia or in Turkey or in Hungary? You know, people need to make their own decisions. So uh, why why did you feel like you needed the need to, you had the need to diversify geographically? So one is a need, another is a want. Um, from the want aspect, I enjoy what I'm doing. I have a level of freedom that is hard to explain. I'm free. Like I'm I'm truly free. I I am free as a bird. I can go anywhere anytime I want in the world. Um I don't have any governments harassing me with regards to anything. I'm I'm completely free. So that's one. It's even if I could get better returns by just doing multifamily housing in like Mississippi. Um, the level of freedom that my investments allow me to get through other passports, through residencies, etc., having bank accounts set up all over the world, to me is worth it because I, I value freedom a lot. Um, so that's one. Two, from a need aspect, this starts to be a bit more political. Um, do you trust the system? Do you trust the financial system? Um, a lot of people don't. A lot of people 
don't feel comfortable having everything in one basket, right? Personally, I'm diversified because I don't know. I don't know. I mean, we're seeing unprecedented crazy monetary policy in a lot of our Western countries. Will they be able to kick the can down the line for a long time? I don't know. Maybe. That's the thing. I absolutely don't know. But by being diversified, I sleep very well at night. When, I, But to be clear, the cost of this is accepting the volatility of my portfolio. Mm -hmm. At any given point in my portfolio, something's blowing up. There is always something that's blowing up in my portfolio. There's always an an investment where it just it's just it's just doing bad um and that's the cost but then generally speaking i i have more investments that are doing better than right. the one that's bad you but mitigate it by position size exactly but it's it can be a bit extreme like it can be quite extreme you know like my uranium might go 4x and then i lose a whole bunch of money on russian adrs and uh you know, it's like, it's all it's all over. Um, but I sleep all night because I'm very diversified across jurisdictions, etc. It's I'm free. You've got a psychological edge. I yes, that's how I feel about it. But most people living what I do, it would just cause them anxiety. Mm. But for me as an individual, it works for me. Um, but then again, it doesn't mean that people need to go hardcore, right? It's perfectly reasonable, you know, let's say you're worth one or two million dollars to say, hey, you know, I'm going to go and like invest, uh, you know, 200K in, in Medellin and get my like 10% cap rates um, and have like a little bit of diversification and then like pay a few thousand dollars and get myself a, a residency in Panama just as a backup, et cetera, you know, yeah. that's. People can just choose the scale at which they want to go down this path. Yeah, they can adjust the volume. They don't have to mm -hmm. go all the way to 10. Great. Uh, what about the United States and Canada and, and Europe? Are you still invested in any one of those countries? Or are, are, not US still, and, are you? Um, U.S. and Canada. So U.S., I had real estate there in the past. I'm out of there. Would I buy real estate now in the U.S. or Canada as long as rates are rising? No. I prefer to be in cash markets where interest rates don't have an impact on the market because there's no lending. Um, mm -hmm. I feel that's fundamentally a bit healthier in a rising interest rate environment. Do I have exposure to the U.S. and Canada? Yes, through stocks. I have quite a few you know, U.S. and Canadian stocks. As for Europe, I don't quite have a lot of European stocks. I have a little bit of real estate left. Gotcha. What uh, what opportunities do you see on the table at the present moment? Um, I know you, you mentioned Uzbekistan in 2019, but what do you see today in 2023? It's I think a big trend is people from our countries. So from the West, whether that be Western Europe or North America, being feeling a bit disenfranchised from the system and wanting to leave. Um, and you see it across the political spectrum. So it's not just a Republican thing or just a Democrat thing, whatever. Increasingly, you see people that leave places like Canada, like the US, because they're sick of politics. The only thing uh, they agree either... on. Sorry? It's the only thing they agree on. It's the only thing you agree on. And they just leave. They just want nothing to do with it. Um, again, I have clients from both sides of the aisle. Mm -hmm. People are sick of it. They just want to live in peace somewhere where the weather's better, where life is cheaper, and where they don't have to deal with the the whole drama and, and crap show. Um, and especially as people retire, and now they can also work remotely. So, hey, you know, suddenly living in Costa Rica or Colombia is, is becoming a lot more. It doesn't mean you have to be poor there or rely on, like, a pension or a trust fund. You, you can actually live in Panama pay less taxes and work from there. You know, before that was only for very few people, but now logistically this is available to a lot of people, to millions of people. So people are 
starting to understand the, the power of this. So I think this trend, which you can play by investing in, in some key hotspots uh, where such people tend to gather is interesting. What about cultural differences? Like how do you, um, do, do you run into issues with cultural differences with the countries you, you partake in? Yeah. How, how do you mitigate that? Patience. <laughs> Generally speaking, comparing to a North American context, as soon as you venture into the Middle East, Latin America, you're just going to have to be patient because people are just not as fast. Got it. And you can go there, be all American, make a scene, blah, 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 blah. Um, people are just going to like get into their shell and just like stop talking to you. Mm. No matter how irrational it would be to stop talking to you, um, they just will stop talking to you. No, in, wh in where, a lot of cultures, you see that. Wh where's your home country, Ladislas? Like where I'm from? Yeah. But that's a complicated one. Okay. <laughs> I'm on, um, I'm French, French passport. Got it. But I lived in Canada for a long time. Got it. Um, so you mentioned the precious metals, you mentioned uranium, uh, what other kind of sectors are you looking at? Are you just sticking to the commodities or do you venture out, um, outside of resource I, investing as well? I venture out, but right now I have a hard time venturing out when I can buy into great companies that like P ratios of three oil companies, mm -hmm. giving me dividends of 20% with governments doing everything in their power to reduce exploration. Right. I just have a hard time finding better value. Yeah. So do you, do you see the oil companies, the, what is it, the, the drillers or the... Um... Yeah, the drillers as well. The, I mean, that's more speculative, but mm -hmm. just from a dividend point of view, you know, companies... Chevron. I don't touch the Americans. They're mm -hmm. too, they're a bit too woke, uh, which goes against the core of what an oil company is. You know, I don't, if I want to go woke, I'll go buy some woke company, not like an oil company that pretends right. to be woke. Um, I'll go straight for, you know, Petrobras in Brazil, Eco Patrol in Colombia. They're dishing up divvies of like 20% plus at like extremely low P ratios. You know, it's, it's hard to say no to that. Is there a most convicted sector you have in mind? Like, what would you say would, you, would be your most convicted? That's a all very good question. That's a very good question. Um, I am across a few different sectors mm -hmm. because, you know, I, I could be wrong. So I'm, I'm mm -hmm. across a few sectors. Got it. So there's not one, like if you had to choose only one, there's very hard to choose. Uh, or just two or just, you know, uh, what you're like your top okay. two. So I, I like real estate in Latin American countries where North Americans are, are moving to and are expected mm -hmm. to move to. Um, from a safety point of view, I think this is interesting. Uranium, I find very compelling, but as a speculation, that's a, it's a compelling speculation, but it's, a, it's about, you know, I'm very aware that I'll, I'll have to get a, out of Dodge at some point. Yeah. Like quickly. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Cause, uh, uranium shoots up pretty, pretty quick itself. You know, you look at the other prior bull markets, yeah. it's a hockey stick for like two months and then whoop, back down. So for like 15 years. Yeah. So um, I think buying is the easy part on this one. Selling is like, that's where your skills are going to be exposed. <laughs> yeah, because you're, you're going to leave money on the table. You have to. You can't you're not you're not going to get this off. Yeah, because this thing's going to take, you know. We're here. We're both like, you know, talking. But, you know, I, like, will we control the internal greed? I don't know. I, I hope so. <laughs> well, we'll see. Well, um, you know, uh, I want to be mindful of your time. Uh, I know, I know we have a limited amount of time. So, uh, where can people find you? Let us last. So the best thing is to follow me on, I have a private list. So it's like a free mailing list on the wandering investor.com sign up. And then you'll get updates as I travel around the world, looking at unique investment and immigration opportunities. I have YouTube as well. Instagram, the wandering investor. Excellent. Any closing thoughts before we sign off? Yeah, I think I think people just need to be very careful. 
people need to be very careful when they make their investment decisions. We're we're just entering a, a completely new world. Um, things are changing right before our eyes. The balance of power in the world is shifting. Uh, we don't quite understand what the implications are, uh, whether it be geopolitically or from a technolo technological point of view. Just keep an open mind. And the most important thing at the end of the day is to admit that you do not know anything. We don't know anything. That's we the think point we of know, but we really don't know. Yeah. Just always like when you're very, when you want to start putting a lot of money behind the thesis, just fundamentally acknowledge that you don't know, that you don't know. Just always allow that, that, that doubt. Things are changing too fast. I mean, just look at the last three years, the, the, the way the world has changed in the last three years. It's insane. Right. The level of change, the pace of change. So when people ask me, what's your five-year plan? It's like, what are you talking about? You just got to be ready to pivot. Yeah. You've got to be what flexible, adaptable. Yeah, exactly. Like, what's, what are you talking about my five-year plan? Like, we're not in like the Soviet Union. Like, no one knows. No one knows. Yeah. If you think you have a five-year plan, you have a problem. Let me tell you. Yeah. We're in the middle of fourth turning. We're in the middle of a completely different political exactly. monetary system being formed right before our eyes. When you've got, exactly. you know, you've got, you know, one block, you know, coming into fruition vis-a-vis -vis the BRICS and, um, you know, the unipolar world is slowly fading away into a multipolar one. And it's, and it's not, it's, it's not going to be a smooth process. It's going to be a messy, volatile process and people need to be emotionally ready for it. They need to be spiritually ready for it and they need to uh, demonstrate a, a level of, of humility and they need to accept that they'll be taking hits like left, right, and center, and they will need to stay strong. 100%. Well, um, that's it for uh, today's episode, guys. If you enjoyed this content, be sure to leave us a like. Be sure to hit the subscribe button on the channel if you enjoyed uh, the guest on the show.